want to welcome you to our Sabbath school lesson. We're continuing to study the book of Isaiah. And for this week, we are speaking about playing God. Playing God. Our memory text is coming from Isaiah chapter 25, verse 9. It says, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him. He will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. The story is told about a preacher who preached a stirring sermon on pride. The end of the sermon, everybody was convicted about the power and danger of the sin called pride. A woman approached the preacher and said, I'd like to confess my sin. I have harbored a lot of pride. The preacher asked, well, how so? The woman said, well, I spent an hour this week looking at myself in the mirror and admiring my beauty. The preacher turned back to this lady and said, uh, I think your sin wasn't pride, but your sin was a sin of imagination. In other words, he's saying you're really not that beautiful. Um, pride has a problem in that it does not know the boundaries of reality. Very often, what causes us pride is our own failure. Your, your weakness becomes strength when you're looking at it through the lens of pride. And that is the danger of pride. Doom on the nations. Isaiah 13 paints a very gory picture of the doom that was going to befall the nations surrounding Israel. And it begins with the Babylonians. Why the Babylonians? It seems Isaiah here is beginning a new section. And in this new section, why wouldn't he begin with the Assyrians, who are the immediate threat, who are the immediate enemy to both Judah and Israel? Isaiah begins with the Babylonians because he's already spoken about the fate of Assyria in earlier chapters. So now he starts to speak about Babylon, which was a distant threat at the time that he was writing, but would become a very uh, powerful oppressor of the nation of Israel. And Isaiah speaks in strong language about the punishment that was going to befall the nation of Babylon or the kingdom of Babylon. We could read Isaiah chapter 13, uh, verse 1 and verse 2. It says, a prophecy against Babylon that Isaiah the son of Amos saw. Raise a banner, bear it on the hilltop, shout to them, beacon to them to enter the gates of the nobles. Isaiah is given a prophecy 
concerning Babylon. And the prophecy ultimately speaks about the destruction of Babylon. Read through Isaiah 13. Notice how strong the language is. Why does a loving God do these things or allow these things to happen? Certainly, some innocent people will suffer, wouldn't they? How do we understand this action by God? What do these texts and all texts in the Bible that talk about God's anger and wrath towards sin and evil tell us about the nature of sin and evil? Isn't the mere fact that a God of love would respond in this way enough evidence to show just how bad sin is. Remember that Jesus is speaking these warnings through Isaiah, the same Jesus who forgave, healed, pled, and admonished sinners to repent. In your own mind, how would you have come to understand this aspect of a loving God's character? Ask yourself this question as well. Could not this wrath actually stem from love? If so, how? Look at it from another perspective, that of the cross, where Jesus himself is bearing the sins of the world. He suffered worse than anyone else has had to suffer, even those innocents who suffered because of the sins of the nation. How does the suffering of Christ on the cross help to answer these difficult questions? When we look at the death of Christ, we must understand that as Jesus is dying, he takes on the wrath of God and he suffers so that nobody has to suffer. And this may help to put in perspective question of sin, suffering, and maybe some of the pictures that we see of God in the Old Testament, the late great city of Babylon. Babylon was restored by a king named Nabopolassar. His son after him exalted it to even greater heights. Finally, it is this king, Nebuchadnezzar II, who goes to attack Jerusalem and takes um, the Israelites captive or the Jews captive um, in Babylon. They live there for a long time. One of the things that uh, we find is that Babylon is, pro is given a prophecy that Babylon won't last forever, but Babylon will also be destroyed. And this is done through the Medes and the Persians, led by Cyrus, who takes over the Babylonian Empire. The Bible also mentions that this city is going to be utterly destroyed and is going to be left desolate. The doom of Babylon comes at the hands of Cyrus. After Cyrus has destroyed Babylon, um, Babylon eventually is left uninhabited by the, time Nebuchad, by, by the time Alexander the Great comes to the throne and takes over their empire. Babylon is almost neglected. Even today, Babylon has really not been restored. Today, it's not a great city anymore, but as few villages just live around the ruins of Babylon. It has been utterly and completely destroyed. Imagine that you were someone living in Babylon at the height of its glory. And re you read the words of Isaiah, particularly Isaiah 13, verse 19 to 22. How foolish and impossible would they have seemed? What other prophecies, yet unfulfilled, seem foolish and impossible to us now? Why would we be foolish, however, to dismiss them as impossible. So somebody who read about the destruction of Babylon long before it happened, when Babylon was at the height of its power, would have ridiculed 
these prophecies. But we need to understand that the word of God is true and will not fail. Even though it doesn't seem likely to our understanding, we need to understand that God has a much greater perspective than we do. The fall of the mountain king. Isaiah 14, we read about the destruction that would befall Babylon. And we start to read about the king of Babylon and we're no longer sure. Are we still speaking about just Nebuchadnezzar or there's something more being spoken about here? Well, God and, or the Bible looks at things not only from the perspective of human events, but God sees the hand that is behind Babylon. So behind Babylon is the devil. And here is what we read, Isaiah chapter 14 from verse 12 to 14. It says, how are you fallen from the heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations? For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into the heavens. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit down on the mount of the congregation, on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will be like the Most High. You see, the sin of Babylon is a miniature representation of the sin that happened in Lucifer's heart, in the devil's heart, who sought to exalt himself and was eventually brought low. So as we read these prophecies, or as we read the message of Isaiah 13, 14, and going on, we need to understand that it's not just speaking about the kingdom of Babylon, but rather God also speaks about the ultimate demise of the devil. And this uh, particular passage of Isaiah 14 is paralleled in Ezekiel 28, when Ezekiel speaks about the king of Tyre, but is really referring to Lucifer and the devil. When we read Isaiah 14, verse 13 and 14, read about the attitude that Lucifer had where he says, I will exalt myself. This is in contrast with the attitude of Christ who brought himself low. Jesus who bent down to wash his disciples' feet. Jesus, who say, where, where the Bible tells us, let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ, who being in very nature God, decided to make himself nothing taking on the nature of a servant or of a slave. This is a stark contrast. The devil seeks to exalt himself, but Christ brings himself down. This contrast here should be very instructive to us as well. What does this contrast, contrast tell us about the character of God as opposed to the character of Satan? What does this contrast tell us about how the Lord views pride, arrogance, and the desire for self-supremacy. Heaven's gate. We read Isaiah 13 and 14, like we've already observed, these are not just speaking about literal Babylon. In fact, you'll discover that Babylon in later times refers to Rome. This is because the biblical writers are not just looking at the power of the oppressive kings or, or the oppressive kingdoms, but they look at the power behind these oppressive kingdoms and they realize that this is the devil. So the same devil active in Babylon is the same devil active in Rome. So whether it's a Roman king or a Babylonian king, the difference is the same. All is the devil who is ruling and the devil bringing pain and suffering in the world. So as we read these passages, we discover they are speaking about the same devil acting through different human actors. This gives us an important insight into our lives as well. 
our enemy is not the one who we see, but our enemy is the one who is unseen. So when someone is doing evil to you, remember that there's a devil behind that person. The devil is still alive and active, and we need to realize that the devil is our enemy and not uh, what we see or the people that we see. Final triumph of Zion. Isaiah 24 uh, to 27 speaks about the final triumph of Zion. In fact, when we read Isaiah 24, it seems very close in language and in description to the scenes that are described in Revelation 20. Why this similarity? Because again, God is not just speaking about how he deals with the enemies of Israel in Babylon or Rome, the Persians or the Greeks, or whoever it may be, but God is speaking about how he ultimately deals with the sin problem. So the description in Isaiah 24 describes what the world will be like during the millennium or during the 1,000 years. This is going forward to that time when Jesus comes again and judgment is taking place. The question may be asked, does God really destroy the wicked? Is God really that, in, that vindictive? Um, and we need to look at this question in light of what the Bible says. Isaiah chapter 28 verse 21 describes this work of God as a strange deed. Something that is very strange because it is not in God's nature to destroy. God's nature is to create. God's nature is to forgive. And so this becomes a very strange but necessary act on the part of God. What we see in Isaiah chapter 24 through to 27 is what we see reflected in the entire Bible, which is no matter the pain, suffering, and the desolation now, in the end, God and goodness will triumph over evil. What then is the only thing we can do if we ourselves want to be part of that final victory? God constantly gives us opportunities to turn from evil and turn to him. God is trying to ensure that none of us is destroyed together with evil. God's destruction is designed for evil, for pain, for suffering. God seeks to bring an end to injustice, but he wants to give you and I eternal life. God's desire is that we be part of that final victory. And that is why God appeals to us constantly, wooing us to himself so that we are never destroyed, but we have life eternal with him. Well, I'd like to thank you again for joining us for our Sabbath school lesson. Until next week, God bless you all and see you again next week. God bless.